Hello, welcome back to April Space 13.21 Against the Rain Part 2. We are back. Uh, you know what would have been a good title? Because um, Nail's all depressed as I'm only happy when it rains. <laughs> I'm only happy when He's it rains. He's looking up at the sky like, <laughs> it's raining. Ah, uh -huh, finally, smile. The rain reminds him of his Tomboy XGF. Alright, we ready? <clears throat> The afterglow of the explosion hung in the air, and the wind whipped past the truck. Muzazi looked up at the aurora he'd created, cold, misty breath flowing from his mouth. Had he done it? No. As the smoke from the explosion of Radiant Almighty finally swept through, Muzazi heard a loud and unmistakable thump strike the metal surface of the carriage. Even before the smoke cleared, he readied his Radiant, prepared to counter any unseen attack that might come. For the moment, however, that attack did not. Instead, the smoke just cleared, revealing the figure of Nail Manrin, standing there, unharmed. The only sign that he'd even been hit by the Almighty was some dishevelment of his clothing, and even that just looked fashionable. <laughs> the, tr the frantic movement of the last few minutes came to an end, and once again the two just stared each other down. That's quite the move, Nail commented, the strings of his shamit choro tasting the air once more. No wonder it put King in checkmate. And yet you're just fine, aren't you? Zazi replied, pointing his radiant at his foe. What's your secret? Nail smiled thinly. Discretion. That's like the cold cut into yeah. this fucking scene. It's like, so like what would happen is the anime episode opened and it's them talking with just a black screen with white words, you know? Yeah. And then this opens up. Oh, it's so good. Wendigo did an amazing job with this. I just want to sit on this for a moment on the OBS yeah, and let the, them the, see the, it. The raging coming out the hands. Yeah, it's so good. Oh, hand saber. You know, it kind of looks like the the Halo sabers, but like distinct enough that it like really feels like it's its own identity. I love it. Clearly, the King of Killers had more than a few tricks up his sleeve, to be expected from an assassin, Muzazi supposed, but that didn't make them any less difficult to deal with. From the information he'd been given, he had been led to believe those string attacks were all yeah, Nail Manor was capable of. Hmm? Nothing. But that clearly wasn't the case. Right before Muzanzi had used Almighty, Manrin had revealed some kind of sound projectile attack and used it to destroy the pillars. That meant his range was much longer than Muzanzi had assumed. Before he'd used that attack, though, he'd brought his strings back into the shamisen itself. So did that mean he couldn't use the sound in strings at the same time? Best not to assume. Then there was obviously some kind of defensive ability at work as well. Radiant Almighty had only been at two-fifths of its full strength, but even so, that had been a direct hit. Judging from the level of Aether infusion Muzazi had observed so far, Manrin shouldn't have been capable of withstanding that unscathed. The King of Killers hadn't used that defense at any other point in the fight, though. Muzazi was certain of that. There had to be a trade-off, then. Was it the same as the sound attack? Could he not use that defense in the strings at the same time? You look like you're thinking pretty deeply, Nail murmured, pacing back and forth like a caged animal, his eyes still locked onto Muzazi. Did I throw you off? My best move is to buy time to observe and think. You wanted to talk to me about failure, Muzazi said. Go ahead. Nail hesitated, his brow furrowing for a second. It's a trick. Regardless of whether or not it's a trick, Muzazi replied. It's what you wanted, isn't it? Go ahead. Give me your sermon. The pacing stopped and the shamisen lowered. For the time being, at least, it seemed the King of Killers was willing to talk. Rain battered against both of them, but the words were still clearly audible. You've been torn apart too, right? Nail asked, stabbed in the back so hard it feels like you're about to collapse into pieces. And you do. I'll see you tomorrow. Aww, Tan Mom. <laughs> She's so sweet. Like everything you believed in, everything you relied on, just vanished in an instant. Like it was never even there in the first place. And you realize that all of it meant nothing. Marie whispered, How I am? No, Uzazi said, slowly shaking his head. No, I can't relate to that at all. Don't lie, Nail snapped, raising his shamachoro back up, the strings writhing in the air like agitated snakes. You can pretend, but I see through you. There's no difference at all between you and me, except you're a fake. You pretend like nothing happened, like you're fine, like you moved on, but people like us don't move on. We can't! You are broken. 
and you will be broken forever. The rain poured over the truck, and another flash of lightning illuminated the city for a moment. Nail's eyes, wide and crazed, glared into Muzazi's past placid gaze. You really believe that? I understand it, Nail snarled. I see. Muzazi closed his eyes for a moment. How pitiable. Nail roared with the ferocity of a beast, swinging his shamachoro and the strings with all his strength. Sparks were spat as the wires scraped against each other, an emotional attack without the King of Killer's usual cold lethality easily taken advantage of. Instead of retreating, Muzazi charged forward, dropping onto his knees and sliding under the razor-sharp strings. He'd seen it back in the museum. Although Shamachoro was capable of fearsome mid-range attack, its efficacy dropped once Muzazi got right into Nail Manrin's face. The Guardian Entity was forced onto the back foot, using all three strings to deflect just one of Muzazi's swords. In terms of raw physical strength, Manrin might have had the edge, but Muzazi wouldn't be outdone when it came to speed. Or at least, that was how it was meant to go. A barrage of black spikes pierced the car carriage of the truck between Muzazi and his target, forcing him to leap back. As he flipped through the air, he swung his radiance, deflecting another swipe from Shamacharo's strings. The jump was risky, though. He'd had to use strong thrusters just so he didn't go flying off of it. Not a maneuver he was eager to repeat. He glanced at the source of the attack, as expected. You disgrace yourself now, Manrin, muttered Muzazi. Nail smiled humorlessly, holding his arms out wide. Look at me, friend, he said, his gaze lethargic. <laughs> Nothing but disgrace. A car was pulling in alongside their truck, and from atop that car grinned members of the Crimson Carnival. At some point, Nail had clearly called in backup. Uzazi quickly counted his new opponents, six in all, and Manrin meant seven. Thump, thump, thump. As one, they leapt off their car and onto the truck behind their boss. None of them bore any uniform, nothing that would define them as members of the Crimson Carnival, but you could tell. A few scowled, others gave cocky grins, and some even laughed. But as they stood by Nail Manrin, weapons slung over their shoulders, the eyes all had the same look. A look that whispered two things. They wanted nothing more than to feel his blood on their hands. And they were sure they'd already done it. Muzazi's frown deepened as the Emerald Eye whizzed by. While a maneuver like this would be frowned upon by the public, it wasn't strictly speaking against the rules. By beginning their match out of the arena, both of them had basically consented to such dirty tactics from the beginning. Yes. Both of them. I. Oh, oh! I! The carriage of the truck was illuminated by a series of rapid purple flashes, and with each flash, one of the interlopers vanished. Soon enough, it was just Muzazi and Nail atop the vehicle once more. Nail frowned at the muffled voices below, voices coming from inside the truck. Looks like you made preparations, he commented, raising an eyebrow. That's surprising. Muzazi couldn't resist a smirk. Whatever Dragon Hadrian has told you about me, he said, raising his blade. His information is outdated. I'm not afraid to get my hands dirty. Wow, Nail chuckled humorlessly. Tell me then, I play dirty, you play dirty. Where's this difference between you and me? You keep acting like it exists, but the difference between you and me, Muzazi interrupted, is that I am capable of thought. Did you really think this was some random truck I happened to land on? Another flash of purple from down below, this time accompanied by a blood-curdling scream. Oh, I forgot his voice. It was kind of, like, vaguely flamboyant. Yeah. I don't well, remember. Not like, not like crazy, so. <sighs> Man, Morgan thought, leaping over a hollow black spikes. I told him Muzazi really knows how to put you through your paces. To be perfectly honest, Morgan had been expecting two or three Crimson Carnival members to back up Manrin. Not six, and certainly not all at the same time. Transporting them inside the sealed space of the carriage with I had been easy, and it had given him the element of surprise. But that didn't mean it was easy. Well, you just yeah. said it was easy. <laughs> you fool. A! Morgan spun through the air as he leapt off with enhanced force, his saber lashing out and slashing open the throat of the nearest assassin. Isn't A amplify? Uh, yeah. Hmm. The unfortunate fellow staggered backwards, clutching his bleeding neck, his eyes bulging out of their sockets. Does he not have to say C after it anymore? Well, C is cuts, so you can amplify without using cuts. Hmm, but then how do you cut him? Because he's using a sword. Oh. As Morgan landed behind him, he struck again. Remember when his swords were just ceremonial? <laughs> no one uses them. <laughs> Foolish. <laughs> Cutting the top of the man's head clean off. I can't off. imagine anyone using a sword. <laughs> <laughs> the, the fucking Ichigo. Yeah. <laughs> 
One down. He'd never even gotten to use his guardian entity. Another hail of black spikes came from a broad-shouldered, pugnant woman near the back of the truck. No, from her guardian entity. A small lupine creature lurking on his shadow. Morgan blocked it with a barrier of amplified fog before jumping through and driving his blade through her temple. Two down. He really didn't understand these guardian entity things. These Crimson Carnival guys seemed to believe that by getting one, they developed some sort of extraordinary power. Maybe their leader had something special with them. They developed an ordinary power and put it inside a rabbit. Whatever advantages an entity conferred, they weren't making use of. Oh well, Morgan thought, rushing under the arm of a third enemy and slashing him as well. Never interrupt your opponent when they're making a mistake, and never educate them while they're being a fool. But still, don't they get tired of being so boring? The sky is not Midoriya Izuku. <laughs> he would never. The truck, uh, actually, popcorn, fuck you. I'm oh, tired. Genius. Uh, the truck turned into an alley between two buildings, wall walls rushing by on either side, the abyss below seeming to stretch on and on forever. Uh, that should be down and down forever, I think. <laughs> He's correct. Okay. As the sounds of muffled combat rang out from within the carriage, as Tony Muzati and Nail Manrin regarded each other, Muzati raised his empty hand, ready to receive Manrin's attacks. Manrin drew his shabby choro back, ready to unleash them. Both of their minds rushed with the burden of the moments before them. Male Mandarin has more subordinates than this, because he thought, I'm willing to bet there are more members of the Crimson Carnival in pursuit, and they'll know not to make contact with the truck this time. I can't worry about that right now, though. The other phases positioned along the route will deal with them. He adjusted the angle of his foot, just a tad. Cold rain battered against the back of his head. Slowly, as if too sudden a movement would be dangerous, he blinked. Right now, he decided. My priority should be whatever defensive ability Manrin possesses. It was sufficient to withstand a roughly half-power strike from Radiant Almighty. That's not something to take lightly. If he's capable of that, he'll be capable of taking any of my other attacks. Can't use Almighty getting his close quarters. Should I abandon the truck and try to get some distance? No, if I do that, I'll have to deal with the rest of the carnival alone. It'd be a fatal distraction. As the rain fell, it sizzled off the Radiant coming from his other hand. Steam rose into the air. I can't think of a way around a shield until I've seen it for myself. I need to force him to bring it out. To threaten enough damage for an attack, he has no choice but to expose the ability. There are ways I can do that. I told me Zazie smiled. Nail Manrin frowned. Judging by the noises below, he thought, inspecting the vibrations as one of the Shamachoro's strings brushed against the carriage roof. There's one person below taking out my backup. One of the eight phases, probably. Is it just the one helping me, Zazie? I doubt it. There'll be more waiting in the wings. As God's blood ran across Manrin's skin, patches started to pale again, revealing the glowing red veins beneath. It was like he was a repugnant statue, the ugliness outside matching the filth within. The sensation grounded him. From what I recall, vehicles like this need either a human drive or a machine to operate it. Would Muzazi trust a machine for this important task? Maybe, maybe not. But if I assume not, that suggests there's another of the eight phases driving. If things go badly, I may need to fight all three of them at once. That would be difficult. The quality of Muzazi's reinforcements is far superior to the scum I have access to. Wow, damn now. He didn't believe in his friends. <laughs> They're not his friends. <laughs> the truck passed through the alleyway. The, the nightly splendor of Azumar <laughs> spreading out before them once Being again. in like the Slaughterhouse Nine Assassin group, and it's like, oh, it's my co-worker again. <laughs> this asshole. The camera machines continue to follow in a great green swarm, like flies to the carcass of battle. Shamishura was able to withstand that massive attack, but it wasn't in full strength. Under no circumstances can I give him a chance to prepare another one. In such close quarters, that shouldn't be too difficult. But he's more cunning than I was warned. Uh, pop one. If that's the case, Muzazi... A toy Muzazi thought... It, oh, sorry. <clears throat> if that's the case, a toy Muzazi thought. If that's the case, Nail Manrin thought. It was a peculiar phenomenon, the moment before two great warriors clashed. They would stare at each other for what felt like hours, running simulations in their minds about how the battle would go, trying to take each and every variable into account. I could never be an anime battler. <laughs> I would just, like, rush in with my cool attacks and get owned. <laughs> the clash between them occurred a thousand times before reality had a chance to catch up. At some point, a step had to be taken. At some point, a fist had to be thrown. The resolutions were the same. I, here, do you want to do one of their voices? Which one I'll you want? Nail. All right. <clears throat> Three, two... One, I'll have to get in closer. 
Thrusters blasted Musazi towards Nail with blinding speed, and the flurry of radiant blows would have been enough to blind a normal human. In this case, though, the strings of Shamachoro were more than a match, reflexively blocking and parrying each and every attack. That did not dissuade the full moon. He continued to press forward step after step, even knowing that he was putting himself in range for a lethal attack. If Nail was blocking Muzazi's attacks, then the reverse was also true. Muzazi's defense began to falter as the rate of whipping wires increased. Muzazi was faster than Nail, to be sure, but he was not faster than the strings. Slowly but surely, blood began to fall onto the metal below. Soon Shamachora was drawing blood with every tenth attack, then every ninth, then every eighth, more and more holes opening in Muzazi's defenses. If this pleased Nail any, however, he did not show it. He just continued to glare, his expression mildly disgruntled. Something's wrong, he thought to himself. This guy should be bleeding more than this. Even if the individual attacks are superficial, he should be bleeding out from them. There's a trick! He saw it immediately, when Shamachoro's third string struck out and slashed Musazi's throat wide open. For a moment. In the same instant that the wound was dealt, before more than a few- Oh, is he cauterizing his wounds as they come in? Before more than a few drops of blood could emerge from the gap, there was a flash of white. When it cleared, the wound on Muzazi's throat was sealed shut, closed. Sweat poured down Muzazi's face as he continued his advance. This is the badass version of Gemini World, where you just <laughs> destroy yourself with cauterized thrusters. He's going to be covered in burns, Tan, just so you know. He's burned Zazi now. I see, Nail mused. Despite everything, he couldn't help but be impressed. This crazy bastard. At the exact same time I open up a wound, he cauterizes it by manifesting thrusters inside his own body. The pain must be unbearable, but I guess that's what resolve looks like. Still, I doubt you can cauterize a chopped off head. Even as the strings cut into his body, Muzazi continued to advance. I can't afford to take another hit like that. Oh, this is him. I can't afford to take another hit like that. He thought, I need to focus the damage I take on the less vital areas if possible. There are parts of my body I can sacrifice if it comes down to it, but that might not be necessary. This should be enough. Indeed, a toy Muzazi had not charged forward and taken all this damage for the sake of getting into position for a plan. Charging forward and taking all this damage had been his plan. If he wanted to force Nail to expose his defenses, he had to trap the current in a painful and sustained attack. Radiant ablaze, blasters thrusting from the floor itself onto his enemy would be suitable, but Manrin knew that too. That was why he was infusing the floor beneath him with his own aether, preventing Muzazi from manifesting thrusters there. It was first come, first served when it came to infusion, after all. However... Nail adjusted his footing, Muzazi's blood covering his boot. White ether sparked through the shut through the shed red. Nail's eyes widened. He realized too late. It was it was first come, first served. And a toy Muzazi had infused his own blood with Aether long before he'd allowed Nail Manrin to shed it. The blood coating the carriage was now a minefield. Radiant ablaze! Thrusters blasted out of the bloodstains, each and every one aimed directly for Nail Manrin's body, buffeting him with heat and force. A blood-curdling scream rang out from the King of Killers as the white fires blasted against him, igniting his coat and his hair. Red Aether, insufficient to defend fully, ran along Manrin's body. He had no choice. Shamichiro! Manrin roared, his voice cracking from the agony. Bachigawa! Is that the secret one? And it's another one. It's another one. Ooh. When are we gonna get the fucking secret one? <laughs> This guy, this is going to be like a five-part fight. My head hurts from all the shouting. I'm sorry. Oh, it's like vibrating my neck too much. No, it's my fault. I'm getting too into it. The strings moved with sudden and frightening speed, enough to force Muzazi to retreat, but they did not attack. No, instead they converged, each one of them aimed squarely for the body of their master. Crimson Aether ran along their surfaces. As Manrin's scream continued, the strings wrapped around his body over and over again, so tightly that the gaps between them ceased to be invisible. Is this his, like, distorted form of killing? <laughs> <laughs> they grew tighter and tighter. And <laughs> <laughs> they grew tighter and tighter and tighter, until the King of Killer's fingers were sharpened into metal claws, and his eyes were nothing but a faint red glow behind layers and layers of metal. The body of the shamisen itself planted itself against his back like an addition to his spine. Looking at the metal man, Muzazi found himself reminded of the citizen from back on Talton. I was just going to say the same. Nail Manrin sighed, voice distorted by his own ether. I felt that one, he said quietly. My turn. And the King of Killers lunged forward, swinging a fist of solid steel. Woo! Woo! They're going through it. <laughs> <sighs> nice one. That was fun. Stand proud. Uh, let me see if we have any questions. 
Land asks, how do... Land asks, how do long-range Aether techniques work, like forcible act ability deactivation? Also, how do teleport abilities work? If it's just recording someone and manifesting them elsewhere, isn't that OP? Can't you manifest them over lava? So basically, what the, um, a long-range ability would do is, like, you would have an effect, basically, and you put that into your Aether and, like, fire it like an Aether bullet. Yeah. And when it hits, it enacts the effect. Yeah, that's what I thought. We might, in fact, we might have already read that one. So teleportation is basically Gemini World, but with certain conditions that increase the speed of it to an absurd degree. Oh. So rather than just and then making your way over to location, it's like, if I've done this and this in advance, I can turn you to Aether, and the I movement of it over there is like nearly instantaneous. I regret to inform you, I think we read that one last okay. week. That's my bad. I thought maybe. Arthur, <laughs> Arthur asks, what's the rarest type of nutrition cube? Um, Jellybug. Jellybug. Is Jellybug good? Uh, Jellybugs were um, created by the gene tyrants as an intelligent food source. Uh, well, Are they like jelly bean flavored? Are there, is it like all different flavors of Jellybug? Yeah, it's like <laughs> the Romans ate dormice. I, I like to imagine there was like a fucking Jellybug collector and he's like, there's just one flavor I'm missing. <laughs> but they uh, died out a lot after the gene tyrants passed, so that's why it's so rare. <laughs> oh, I can't imagine why, because they're a sugary sweet food that everything can eat and kill. Yeah. <laughs> JTKC says, How popular is the October Jones franchise? What are some media from the series? Movies, TV shows, plays? And what's the rarest October Jones merchandise? I mean, it's sort of like the Sherlock Holmes of the setting, really, in terms of like that sort of pop culture position. Like it's been around for like a hundred years? No, no, no. But in terms of like, you have like that, those sorts of stories, those sorts of movies, adaptations, sort of thing, TV series. It's like Law and Order. Yeah. Celebrity guest stars on October Jones. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, chicken punk episode! And he's like, ah, I was assaulted. <laughs> All right, well, thank change, you guys. <laughs> thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you next time.